Very good. Um, last day of uh, London Valve 2023. Uh, we are going to discuss the so-called essential of lifetime management of TAVI patient. It is a session sponsored by uh, Mary Life, and uh, it, it's quite interesting at this meeting again, we saw some new iteration of the aortic valve. I mean, it's not yet finished and some new generation. So the first uh, learning objective was to describe this uh, new generation of uh, heart valve for aortic, key futures, procedural and clinical benefit. And uh, to learn tips and tricks on two things, bicuspid and valve in valve. Valve in valve is increasing continuously you remember on day one, we had this wonderful case of uh, Evolute in a Lotus, a Lotus who had 18 millimeter diameter, so quite challenging, but uh, Toulouse, the group of Toulouse did a wonderful job. And then we will talk, talk about some kind of new concept, which is the intermediate size. You know, if the surgeon have to make a step down of two millimeter and other valve three millimeter, there is now it's what we call intermediate step of 1.5 millimeter. And finally, uh, talk about the very large size. You know, something goes beyond 29 and 30 and 31 and 32. I have uh, with me Andreas uh, Bombach. I think the whole week we have been partner in crime. Uh, and we have a wonderful panel, all uh, well-known people. We don't have to introduce them. So, Andreas, I think uh, we should start and uh, introduce the first speaker. Before we do that, uh, for you in the room, there are microphones if you have questions uh, at the end of the talks. And for you online, there is, of course, the option to ask questions, which will pop up on my screen here, and then I can relate them uh, uh, to the panel. And at the end, if you use the app, please use the app. At the end, please rate this session. Uh, feedback is very, very important to constantly improve the quality of our education here. Now we can start. The first speaker is uh, Sengo from uh, India, who's going to talk about evolving data on TAVI in bicuspid aortic valve intervention, particularly relevant where you are. Good morning. So we know that the bicuspid valve is really a challenging area, though uh, many of the trials have excluded bicuspid valves uh, for obvious reasons. So now we have uh, not much data actually on mid and long term outcomes in bicuspid valves, and still it's not recommended in guidelines. So, but we have more and more encountering with greater frequency, particularly when we treat young patients and nearly more than 50% of patients who go for surgery are bicuspid valves. So it's really problematic. We know that uh, it's a challenging anatomy for uh, many reasons, for calcium and aortic uh, aortopathy. So what we know about TAVI in bicuspid valve, uh, though the anatomy may be challenging, uh, we know that uh, TAVI is feasible and safe in bicuspid valves. And the one-year mortality is similar to surgery and with such uh, tricuspid aortic valve. And we have seen better results with new generation heart valve devices. And we also know from um, and, uh, Yoon and Muckert's data that calcified RAFE and uh, heavily calcified leaflets are really associated with poor outcomes. So let me now throw on the new insights from the new generation valves uh, in bicuspid valve, which is recently emerging. And uh, this is uh, one of the studies uh, uh, which where, so where the MyVal was uh, retrospectively studied in uh, 68 uh, patients. Uh, it was a retrospective collection in 12 centers and in, in uh, India, Denmark, Italy, and Croatia. And uh, procedural as well as a 30-day follow-up were collected. And uh, here the procedural death was zero. And uh, you could look at 30-day outcome. Uh, the patients who had a uh, uh, high hemodynamic, uh, high, high uh, more velocity, more than three meters per second, were only one, that is 1.5 percent, and uh, valve gradient more than 20 was only one. So basically, the outcomes of third days were very good, and uh, early safety was clearly shown with the all-cost mortality of only three percent. The hemodynamic uh, uh, effects on 30 days were clearly very favorable, with uh, uh, almost zero severe AR, with uh, uh, 
and uh, most of them had raised a mild AR of 20%, and the transfer of mean gradient was uh, in single digits. So there's, there's, again, this study was followed up for up to one year, and uh, here again it was uh, shown that the, the pacemaker rate was 8.3%, and the, and the major bleedings were very less, and uh, uh, mainly the follow-up was up to one, one year, more than a year, and the all-cause mortality was uh, in seven patients, at 11.3%. So, and if you look at the phenotypes of the bicuspid valve, uh, it had, uh, most of them were type 1A, uh, which is the most common as we know. And if you look at this uh, performance from 30 days over one year, uh, it was uh, very clear the benefit, uh, the, it was per the benefit what we saw in the, at uh, 30 days was persisting up to one year, and the mean gradient at one year was 10 millimeters of mercury, and uh, the valve area again uh, was quite maintaining at 1.7. So uh, again, if you look at the AR at uh, one year, uh, the severe AR was in only 2%, so which is uh, quite uh, interesting. So the key takeaways take from this study was uh, uh, the, 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 the patients were treated at one year with bicuspid valves that uh, showed a mortality in 11.3% and all-cause hospital rehospitalization in 21% and the permanent pacemaker was 8%. And the hemodynamics were excellent with a mean gradient of 10 and a EOA of 1.7 centimeter square and moderate to severe AR in only 2%. So next I would want to uh, highlight the Triton study. Again, this is uh, again a, a study which was done of the new generation valves, uh, comparing three valves, uh, a retrospective study. Uh, again, uh, this was uh, uh, studied with the Cypian 3 Ultra, the My valve, and the Evolute Pro Plus valve. Uh, you look at the patients, were 80 patients in each uh, group, and uh, uh, mainly the primary endpoint of the study was device success, uh, which is uh, freedom from mortality, uh, surgery, or uh, intervention. And uh, the secondary endpoints uh, was uh, uh, composite endpoints of uh, safety, which is uh, all-cause mortality, all-stroke, or major bleeding, or major vascular complication. So the Triton study, again, if you look at the three groups, um, most of the patients with uh, MyVal had uh, pre-dilatation, and also in the group with Evolute Pro Plus had about 79% had uh, pre-dilatation. And uh, post-dilatation was mostly seen in the group with Evolute Pro Plus. So uh, the, uh, what was seen in the results was uh, uh, in valve embolization was 2.5% uh, at Evolute Pro Plus, which was uh, not there in Sapien or MyVal. And uh, hemodynamic instability again was more in the in the Evolute Pro Plus group. So the procedural success was 100% in both the Sapien 3 and MyVal uh, versus uh, uh, about 93.8% in the uh, Evolute Pro Plus. So 30-day outcome, again, the permanent pacemaker was uh, not different between the three groups, uh, the Sapien, MyVal, and the uh, and Evolute Pro Plus. And the all-cause mortality uh, was 2.5% uh, in the Sapien group and 38 uh, Again, however, it's not statistically significant. Numerically, there was uh, nil in the MyVal group. And uh, the myotic mean gradient, I think that's, again, to uh, uh, look at the mean gradient. It's clearly uh, lowered a single digit with 8 millimeters of mercury uh, uh, in the MyVal group, and it was statistically different from the Sapien group. And this is probably uh, related to the intermediate sizes uh, which has resulted in, in better gradients of MyVal compared to the Sapien 3. And also, if you look at the, 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 there is no difference between the Evolute Pro Plus and the MyVal group in terms of mean gradient. Moderate, more than moderate AR was uh, higher numerically in the Evolute Pro Plus group, uh, I th though it was not statistically significant. So the device success uh, was seen in 100% in MyVal group, and uh, it, was, uh, it was also, compared to uh, the Evolute Pro Plus, uh, they are probably related to uh, reduction in uh, severe AR. So intermediate sizes were used in almost a quarter of cases and extra large sizes in about 5% of cases uh, in MyVal group and uh, about 32% in Evolute Pro Plus group. So the need for second processes was more frequent in the Evolute Pro Plus group uh, due to em uh, embolization. So no other procedural complications uh, related to that. So again, it was seen that uh, in the Sapien group, compared to the MyVal group, uh, the re what you see in the red is the aortic valve area. So comparatively, the, My the MyVal group had a bigger area which was statistically significant. The blue lines are the mean gradient, and c compared to the MyVal group and the Evolute Pro Plus, 
uh, there was uh, no statistical significant whereas myvala sapin group there was a significant statistically uh, significant difference so overall outcomes uh, device success uh, among the three groups you could see that there's, there's no statistical difference between sapin and the myval uh, uh, been evaluated propolis and myval and there was significance between uh, sapin and the myval the early safety again was very promising so the key takeaways from the triton study there was excellent safety profile in all three devices there are no cases of uh, coronary occlusion and loss rupture aortic dissection or any procedural death 100% in hospital procedural and technical success was observed in sapien 3 and myval and 93.8% in the evolute propolis group so the device success was again the highest with 100% in the myval group and the device success and the early safety were better in myval group probably because they have different mechanisms a better gradient compared to sapien valve and uh, better in, in, uh, less amount of moderate or severe ar compared to the evolute propolis and the rate of pacemaker was uh, almost same in all the three groups so to conclude uh, our, as our experience in treating the bicuspid valves is growing i think the emerging new data is more encouraging and uh, that a bicuspid valve tavi is associated with excellent mid term outcome with all the three new generation tavi devices of the second generation devices the early data show myval to be very promising device to treat bicuspid valves thank you thank you so let let's see the panel i mean uh, a few years ago we were afraid of the bicuspid valve you know and i think uh, last year uh, rashmaka was presenting the registry in usa and the results were quite reassuring and if you listen to the speaker it seems that in terms of pacemaker paravalvular leak it's quite similar to what we have seen before francesco as a surgeon are you surprised by that or you were anticipating the fact that we would be able to cope with the bike speed tell you a secret my very first tavi was with antonio it was a pvt it was back in 2003 i think and it was a bicuspid so obviously there are challenges uh, but i think in the last few years we learned about more about the anatomy about how to size uh, how to implant differently from uh, tricuspid anatomy and i think today we are ready to tackle this uh, this kind of patients very good so no surprise that question uh yes we have a question from remzi akart who's online uh, it's actually for sengo i think you still have your microphone on so are there any data about balloon perforation during the implantation very practical question how often does that happen that what is this uh, series that you've gone through i think that balloon perforation uh it's been we have not seen any balloon perforation with this uh, generation of my valve when bicuspid valves in particular So no balloon perforation uh, during the actual valve implantation with a balloon expandable system. Okay. Thank you. Very good. So we will go to the next topic, uh, quite uh, new uh, TAVI in extra large uh, annulus not as trivial as presumed. That's the title of uh, Stefan Tokwela. Stefan Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Already there. Uh, yeah, thanks for the invitation. Uh, this is indeed a very interesting topic. I would say these are my conflicts. So this is our data from Lucerne. This is aortic stenosis data, and you can see the annuli here, uh, ranging from very small, like uh, 60 millimeter perimeter, to uh, up to 100 millimeter perimeter, or area of more than 700 square millimeters. Now, if we look at the current generation valves, we can see that with Navitor and Accurate Neo 2, we can cover about 80% of these anatomies. And then with Evolute and Sapien 3, they do really good. They cover close to 100%. Of course, these data, they vary between different centers and different uh, countries. Um, now, if you look at the MyVal, and just to visualize what step this is, we can cover now all aortic stenosis patients and we will also cover many of the aortic regurgitation patients 
Now, I start uh, with an Evolute Pro Plus uh, implantation, a 34 millimeter. So this is a large anatomy, a perimeter 86, horizontal aorta. And you can see here the anatomy. And then this is how we implanted the valve, and we got a good result. So why did we get a good result here? Uh, we have a high implantation at the non-coronary cusp side, very important. And then despite the high implantation on the left coronary cusp side, you can see that we're quite low. But this is because we have an angulation and because the, the root is quite horizontal. Now, again, this was a very good result, but it illustrates the difficulty when we treat such patients, especially if they have a horizontal aorta. So it's like sailing a long way over the Atlantic. If you're a few degrees off and you have a long way to sail, it will make a difference. So this is another patient from Lucerne uh, with severe regurgitation. And now here, the anatomy is something completely different. You can see we have an area of more than 700. We have a perimeter of 95, and there is absolutely no or almost no calcification. So way out of range. Even if this was calcified aortic stenosis, I think it would be very challenging to treat with, uh, with uh, Sapien or with an Evolute. So here we need a big valve. And this is what we get. We have the MyVal OctaCore 32 millimeter valve. It's a transfemoral axis, of course, and it goes through a 14 French expandable sheath. Now that sheath will expand quite a bit, but the introducer profile is 14 French. And of course, we don't do pre-dilatation, that's clear. Now you can see here the nominal area is 804 square millimeter, but we are okay to overexpand this valve up to one or two millimeters and we need about 20% oversizing. So we overfilled the balloon by a few milliliters here in this case. You can see the large anatomy on the left side and then crossing of the arch uh, with this large valve. And then here is how we position. And then the inflation is very slowly. It needs to be quite controlled. You can adjust, of course, during the inflation because there is not much calcification. So if you're not happy with the position, if you think it's too low, or even too high, you can uh, maneuver a bit on the catheter. But we didn't do that here. And then we have this final result. So the valve is really, it's impressive. If you see it in your own cat lab, it, also if you inflate it, it just never ends. It expands and it expands. And you can see the post-procedural echo, which is also very good. We had like trace uh, regurgitation. <laughs> and the patient was discharged uh, two days later. Something that's also interesting in, that comes in hand is the reduced uh, foreshortening compared to other devices. And this is due to the design of the stents. So we have a lot of vertical stents here. And if you inflate the device, everything that's uh, like oblique is going to foreshorten, but everything that's already vertical is not going to do anything. So here we have with the large size, with the 32 millimeter, we have 20% oversizing. And if you inflate the valve, you will feel that or you will, it gives you more stability and more control during the inflation process. How much do we need to oversize? So this depends, of course, and this is true for all valves, not only for the Mival Octacore. But if you have heavy calcification, you want to oversize less. If you have less calcification, you want to oversize maybe 10, 15%. And if you have pure regurgitation, you should aim for 20% oversizing of the annular area. There is uh, some really nice evidence, which was published in your intervention this year. Uh, in it uh, includes 113 patients uh, undergoing TAVI for pure aortic regurgitation with the MyVal. And if you look at the patient characteristics, it's actually not so different from a typical TAVI population. But if you look at the echo data here on the top right, you can see that ejection fraction is lower. And of course, the LV EDD is 64, so really big uh, ventricles. And the mean is only six, of course. There is no stenosis. And then if you look at the CT data, annulus area is 640, so really big. Perimeter is large. And you can see the other parameters here listed on the table. And these are the procedural characteristics. And you can see uh, on the bottom left that most cases, of course, 72% had the extra large 32 millimeter valve. 
and 12% uh, the 30.5 millimeter uh, valve, so most had the XL sizes. And what is also interesting that this overfilling of the balloon is actually more the rule than the exception because you want to achieve 20% oversizing and it's, uh, it's rare that this is exactly the nominal diameter. So usually you want to put one, two, three, four, five, uh, up to six millimeter, uh, milliliter extra in the balloon. And that gives you this oversizing of, of 20%, 18% in this study. Um, you can see here the oversizing according to device size. So again, it was uh, more the rule than the exception. There were a total of four embolizations in this study. Three were in the ventricle, one in the aorta. And these were all in patients with a very wide LVOT. So if the LVOT is, is really flaring, it doesn't give you any support, then it's uh, really difficult um, to implant this valve and you may need even more oversizing. And then these are finally the results at 30 days and one year. Um, again, this is important to notice, this is, is not a TAVI. So usually if you look at existing studies, the device success rate is around 80% for aortic regurgitation. So this is not, we're spoiled by 95% device success with the TAVI population, with the aortic stenosis population, but in aortic regurg, it's completely different. So here in this study, we also had this 95%, I would say for the first time, so very high rate of device success, although there were some embolization and you can see there are still some patients with, with, the, uh, with aortic regurgitation. So it's not 100%, but I think it's certainly an excellent case series uh, of this uh, patient population that we usually cannot treat at all. All-cause mortality, if you look at one year, was 10%, at, at 30 days, 5%, so really low between 30 days and one year, and there was also no sign of degeneration. So this is my summary slide. Uh, we, clearly, larger anatomies are more challenging, and even more so if there is no calcification. The MyVal Octocor XL sizes allow treatment of these patients, certainly of all patients with aortic stenosis. I cannot imagine a patient that has more um, than uh, 32 millimeters, and of many with aortic regurgitation, not of all, but of many. Then overfilling the balloon helps you to really achieve this desired 20% oversizing. If you add three milliliters, as a rule of thumb, you will get one millimeter extra. So adding six millimeter gives you two millimeter extra uh, diameter. You shouldn't add more because then you risk a central aortic regurgitation. And the predominantly vertical stent design minimizes for shortening during the implantation. And um, there is a 35 millimeter XXL valve. It uh, has been implanted for pulmonary regurgitation. We don't know if, if it's available for aortic regurgitation in future. Certainly the leaflet stress gets higher and higher. Pulmonary not so much because diastolic pulmonary pressure is low, but aortic diastolic pressure is a little bit higher, uh, but certainly interesting to see what's coming next. And uh, with that, I would like to thank you for your, your attention and for the invitation. Stay there for, for one minute because, sure. you know, for the audience, the octa-core is a novelty. I uh, make his entry in the arena of uh, PCR this year. So just, I mean, you showed the picture a few times. Mm. Uh, the key features is from uh, hexagon, you go to an octagon. That's point number one. Only two row of cell, 50% free and 50% with the skirt. Mm. And then shortening of 19, 20%. That's, I think, the key point of that uh, new valve. Yeah, it's a very symmetrical design, as you point out. There is two symmetrical rows of these octagons, which is also quite unique. And this also gives the valve more stability. So I think what's really impressive when you use it the first time is that you inflate it and there is pretty much no motion, no motion like no foreshortening, no movement. It's, it feels very stable. And, and we have to emphasize that these two uh, Octagon create interlace struts, which is a very robust if, filler yes, for, the, yeah, for the valve. Good radius. Very good. Yeah. One technical thing the largest 32 millimeter, 
goes to 860 millimeters yes. square. Uh, I think yesterday, uh, Andreas, we saw one case going to 960 millimeters square without problem of cooptation. But mm. I'm just mentioning the fact, and you make that very carefully, the rules to add the ML to get a little bit more area. But I think uh, 860 of 960, that will resolve a lot of problems. Any question from there the There is audience? one question uh, from Philip Hager, who is on site. Uh, and, uh, how much oversizing do you need in AR without any calcium? Yes, yeah, so this is uh, about 20% 20 20 area, area oversizing. Okay. Very good. Any question, any comment from India? Any experience with this uh, new technology? Yeah, I would like to add one thing that with OctiCore, they have tried commercial alignment and it works well. That is one thing. And in India, we have a lot of bicuspid valves. And, you know, we had less options because the sizes were 20, 23, 26, and 29. But, you know, you can imagine a patient with a with an annular size of 24. So you are more comfortable taking 24.5 at maybe one or two cc's less. So it matches the anatomy more, more perfectly. So it decreases the risk of probably annular rupture and other complications, which are probably slightly on a higher side with the conventional balloon expandable valve. So I think matching anatomy decreases the risk of the annular rupture, decreases the chances of PVL. And also it, with, with one or two cc's plus or minus, you are actually covering 0.7 millimeter sizes, like 24.5, then you can make it 25, 26 can be made 25.5. So it's a, it's a huge range which respects anatomy a lot. Good. I think that you had one point is the uh, alignment, which has been described in uh, Jack intervention this year. So if you want to see how to align, because it's quite unique, it's something which done outside the patient and yes. then move into the patient. So I think based it's on uh, the CT, on the yeah. baseline yeah. CT. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Very Thank good. You Thank very you very much. much. That, that was the perfect segue for. The next talk, which will be about the sizing rationale, tips and tricks for valve in valve interventions, Alfonso uh, Lilassi. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for the invitation. So, when approaching aortic valve in valve procedure, some points are of paramount importance. First of all, uh, to know the type and size of the surgical bioprosthesis, then to assess the risk of coronary obstruction and patient prosthesis mismatch, and considering future coronary reaccess, particularly if we are, we are treating young patients. So as you know, there are many surgical bioprosthesis, different in terms of tissues, frames, and implantation methods. We can distinguish three big families, stented, stentless, and sutureless, and the treatment of uh, all of these single um, uh, subtypes is uh, different when we are doing a uh, transcatheter valve in valve procedure. So first of all, it's important to know the uh, size of our bioprosthesis and the size. So porcine bioprosthesis uh, have uh, usually an internal diameter which is at least two millimeter or less as compared to the stent diameter. Pericardial bioprosthesis have a true internal diameter which is at least one millimeter less to the stent diameter, while pericardial bioprosthesis with externally mounted leaflets have a true diam internal diameter which is almost the same as compared to the uh, stent diameter. We can decide the size of our transcatheter valve according to this very useful app that you for sure know. And moving to the challenges in valve in valve procedure, first of all, I would like to consider coronary obstruction, which is a serious and potentially life-threatening complication. Uh, it can occur three to four-fold more commonly after valve in valve procedure as compared to native valve uh, tower. And when treating stentless uh, uh, and stented BHVs with externally mounted leaflets, the risk of coronary obstruction is higher as compared to other uh, types of bioprosthesis. So what to look at um, for uh, coronary obstruction, which parameters? Two, mainly, virtual transcatheter art valve to uh, coronary distance, VTC, 
and virtual transcatheter heart valve to sinotubular junction distance, VTSTJ. Mm -hmm. So usually when the VTC is less than four millimeter, we can uh, consider our patient as a high risk patient for coronary obstruction, while in case of VTSTJ less than 2.5 millimeter, we can consider as well the patient as a high risk for coronary obstruction. So other important aspects to be um, uh, known are the uh, extents of the leaflets above the coronary ostium or above the STJ level. So merging all those information, we can uh, consider, as I said before, the patient has a high risk for coronary obstruction, and then we can apply some strategies to prevent coronary uh, obstruction, in particular chimney stenting, it means to uh, implant a stent at the level of the left main across to the left main ostium or the RCA ostium uh, uh, into the uh, aortic lumen or basilica procedure, which means to lacerate one of the uh, cusps of the bioprosthesis in order to uh, uh, avoid coronary obstruction. So similarly to coronary obstruction, several uh, aspects must be considered in order to um, um, have information about a potential future difficulty to uh, reaccess coronaries, in particular VTSTJ, more than two millimeter or less than two millimeter, and coronary origin above or below uh, the uh, ceiling, uh, uh, neo ceiling skirt of the um, uh, valve uh, implanted within the gen degenerated bioprosthesis. So merging all those aspects, uh, we can choose a balloon expandable device or a self-expanding device. Usually self-expanding devices are preferred in case of smaller degenerated bioprosthesis, I mean more, less or equal than 23 uh, mm, or in case of stented bioprosthesis with rings not fracturable, while in all the other situation a balloon expandable device can also uh, be um, considered for our valve-in-valve -valve procedure. So I would like to show you some uh, cases. The first is a female, 17 23 year old, which underwent uh, AVR with a 23 mm Toronto stentless full aortic root bioprosthesis. She was admitted because of effort dyspnea at a transthoracic echo. A uh, uh, degeneration, a structural valve degeneration was diagnosed. Severe regurgitation uh, was there. Um, uh, Toronto 23 mm has a true ED of 21 uh, uh, millimeter. This is the CT scan, so uh, calcification are mildly represented at the level of the leaflets. Uh, area at the annular site was 415 millimeter uh, square, similar to the LVOT area. VTC was 4, VTSTJ3, so the patient was considered as a high to intermediate risk for coronary obstruction, so it was decided to implant a balloon expandable device with low height frames. In particular, uh, first gen MIVAL 24.5 mm with a 13.6% oversize, according to the annular area. This is the final result after a low implant at the level of the annular plane and mini chimney uh, stenting with a 4.0 uh, uh, stent implanted uh, at the level of the uh, aortic edge of the uh, first gen MIVAL. So gradients were fine in terms of hemodynamics and echo. Second case, 84 year old male, prior AVR with stentless bioprosthesis, Freedom Solo 27 uh, mm. He was admitted because of pulmonary edema uh, at TT echo, a massive uh, aortic regurge due to leaflet prolapse was diagnosed, LV and RV systolic function were uh, depressed, and severe pulmonary hypertension was there. This is the Freedom Solo Bioprosthesis, which is a two layers of Povin pericardium um, uh, bioprosthesis implanted with a single running suture line. The true ED of this bioprosthesis is the same of the, almost the same of the uh, stent frame of the stent uh, diameter. This is the CT of our patient. As you can see, the area, the annular level is of 714 millimeter square, while at the level of the LVOT, the area was uh, larger. So. This is a dominant LVOT with a tapered annulus to LVOT complex. The left main takeoff was relatively low, 6.4 mm. So according to uh, all those measurements, um, it was uh, planned to uh, use a 32 mm balloon expandable uh, THV with a 
12.6% oversize, but in order to safely anchor our device in a um, valve without, in a leafless without calcification, we increased the volume into the balloon of 3 ml. We decided for myval octagon. And as you know, as colleagues already said, the benefit, one of the benefits of this um, THV family is related to the uh, huge variety of sizes, in particular intermediate sizes and XL sizes. So this is the uh, basal orthogram. In the middle, the deployment phase with the second radiopec marker aligned to the bottom of the pictel, slow inflation, then stent implantation, even in this case in a mini chimney fashion. And this is the final result at angiography, hemodynamics and echo. Pretty satisfying, even if there is a mild leakage, uh, we were already, uh, able to fix a very uh, complex uh, valve degeneration. Last case, TAV in the generated excess stented uh, um, bioprosthesis, female, 74 year old, she underwent uh, surgical aortic valve replacement with Magna East 19 millimeter implantation. After implantation, mean postoperative gradient was 22 millimeter of mercury. Few months later, the patient was admitted because of pulmonary edema, non-structural valve degeneration, but severe patient prosthesis mismatch, LVF 30%, uh, kidney disease, and eye surgical risk. So the patient was initially evaluated for surgical reintervention, but was rejected by surgeons, so uh, it was referred for TAV uh, in SAV uh, with balloon valve fracture. Uh, we did a non-contrast CT scan, coronary eye it was relatively uh, safe, but we um, planned to implant, in this case, a self-expanding device with supra-annular uh, leaflet position, balloon valve fracture using a true balloon 20 millimeter because the true ED was 17 millimeter, coronary protection because the uh, case was performed only under TT uh, echo monitoring without uh, contrast just for safety reason. So after valve implantation, balloon valve fracture was attempted, but there was a valve embolization then the uh, valve was nerved, and then the balloon was inflated, the ring was fractured, a second TAVI device was advanced through the first one embolized and then implanted in a correct uh, position within the degenerated surgical bioprosthesis. Uh, sorry. Uh, I skipped one, one slide. So this is the final result in terms of echo and hemodynamics, and this is the fluoroscoping at CT view of the fractured ring. So in conclusions, valve in valve tower is associated with unique challenges, a careful evaluation of the bioprosthetic valve in association with patients, clinical and anatomical features is the key for a successful valve in valve procedure. Novel transcatheter art valves and techniques play a crucial role in order to achieve an optimal result when treating valve uh, degenerated surgical bioprosthesis in aortic position. Thank you for your attention. Very good. Excellent, uh, Alfonso, excellent, yeah. Um, would you agree that before getting embark in a valve in valve, you have to understand what is there before getting a strategy? Because you have the annular, the supraannular type of uh, treatment. Uh, how do you do that? I mean, let's say that tomorrow you got uh, a valve in valve in the Lotus or in the accurate Neo2. Uh, how, how do you prepare yourself? I mean, uh, in Galway, I've done a lot of work in silico. I, I, I've learned a lot by doing yeah. that. But how do you do that? You have a valve that you have never done valve in valve, and tomorrow you have to do it. What, what is your strategy to approach that problem? Well, first of all, I would like to, to, to highlight the point that surgical aortic bioprosthesis are different to transcatheter art valves. Of course, the mm, field of Tower in tower is a new field, so we are approaching to this new field. We are mm, uh, knowing and learning more and more, uh, but the case actually are not very much. So I prefer to talk about bioprosthetic, aortic de uh, valve degenerated. So as I said at the beginning of, of my presentation, I for sure look at the type of the bioprosthesis, 
the size, in particular the internal uh, diameter, uh, and the risk of coronary obstruction, patient prosthesis mismatch, and the potential for a difficult coronary reaccess uh, in the future. So in case of small degenerated surgical bioprosthesis, I usually prefer to go with a self-expanding valve with supraannular leaflet position that in order to avoid a patient prosthesis mismatch or potentially uh, um, early degeneration of the valve. In While on the, on the other side, uh, balloon expandable devices are of course fine, particularly in cases where coronary obstruction is a concrete uh, uh, risk. In, in one word, do you see something for simulation before doing a case? when you have something that you have never done before? Well, why, why not? Why not? Why not? Why not pro Let's go to Mohamed uh, Abdel Wahab. I mean, uh, Leipzig must have seen a lot of uh, Taver in Taver. And you know, it's, it's becoming quite worrying because uh, at some point there will be a third uh, valve. I mean, when you see the first case at this meeting, uh, the Evolute in the Lotus, the panel was anonymous. You have to use a self-expanding in a Lotus, which was 18 millimeter. And they did a beautiful job by reducing the gradient from 60 to 8. What, what is the experience of Leipzig in the Taver valve in valve? So you mean um, redo Tavi, Tavi in Tavi? Yeah. Like, but, but two valves, not yeah. three inside each other. Okay. Not three, it not will three. come, but... Yeah. <laughs> so um, it's, um, it's, um, it's not big yet. So we are seeing the cases, they are increasingly coming up, but there's no explosion in redo procedures. So um, I think um, in our practice, uh, we do maybe around 10 to 15 redo TAVIs a year, which is less than yeah, it's less than 1% of our procedures. Um, fortunately, uh, the valves that are coming, uh, for example, the, uh, like the long self-expanding devices that are more difficult to treat, these are the valves that have been implanted like a, a long time ago, and the majority of these have been implanted quite deep, so retreating them is not a big challenge. Um, but what we are starting to understand, particularly when we're seeing now patients that are coming, uh, even with short uh, frame devices, uh, that these are not uh, automatically easy to treat or easy to retreat. So the notion is that a shorter device is probably easier to retreat than a longer device, similar to like what we know from surgery. We are used to treating short frame devices, but it really depends on how they have, um, have been implanted and how they are aligned. Um, and this is why I found it interesting, for example, that the platform here, the, uh, the, the mirror valve, that you can obviously align it. I don't have personal experience with that. This is something that we cannot really do with Sapien. Very good. Andreas, thank you. No more questions from the audience, so we can swiftly move on to the last one. So the last one is a recorded case by uh, Philip Freeman. It will take 20 minutes, so we will be just on time. Yeah? Don't stop too many times in the video. <laughs> I think we'll have plenty of time. <laughs> good. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, it's a great pleasure to talk about uh, my val implantation. We're going to bring together some of the uh, aspects that we've been talking about already. Um, my name is uh, Philip Freeman. I'm an interventional cardiologist in Olbo. Um, and on the slide, you'll see my Twitter tag together with uh, our interventional echo, uh, one of our interventional echo colleagues, uh, Frederick. Frankly, uh, as important as the first operator, uh, these cases can't be done without uh, this new subspecialty of interventional echo, which is critical to these uh, more complicated cases. We are a center of uh, three in the west of Denmark running the COMPARE TAVI trial. We've just finalized inclusion of uh, 1,031 patients, randomized 50-50 between ULTRA and MyVAL. So hopefully this time next year, we'll be presenting the one-year results, which uh, a lot of people are looking forward to. Uh, the lead for that trial is uh, Christian Telgesen from uh, Aarhus. My conflicts. That's our TAVI team. We're not the biggest center, um, but we have a, uh, there's me in the background, so our nurses, anesthesia, 
uh, nice hybrid room. Uh, the guy in the white T-shirt is a surgeon uh, who uh, is a primary operator for TAVI, uh, Paul Eric, who's very important to the team, especially for these more complicated procedures and uh, a good guy to work with. Basilica is the case that we're going to look at today, uh, bioprosthetic or native aortic scallop, uh, intentional laceration to prevent iatrogenic coronary artery obstruction during TAVA. And I hope that we can bring together some of the things that we've already been talking about, such as commissure alignment. Our patient is 76 years old. Uh, she has severe aortic stenosis uh, with a peak of 95, mean of 45, multiple comorbidities, moderate renal dysfunction, uh, emphysema, moderately impaired LV, and of course, a surgical turn down. I would like to say she's 76. Um, so the idea that this lady may survive uh, quite a number of years and need a redo TAVI uh, is, is a reasonable thought, uh, and that's why we need to talk about, uh, in this patient, lifetime management. <coughs> Risk factors for coronary artery obstruction, small annulus, small sinuses, her cusp height is uh, greater than her coronary height, her valve to coronary distance, VTC, is less than four millimeters, heavily calcified nodules towards the tip of the right coronary cusp, and um, low and small STJ. She's got a low uh, RCA, and and not so low uh, left coronary. I would refer you to the paper here uh, published recently by Jeff Khan on predicting uh, coronary obstruction. It's, uh, it's, it's validated scoring system that works pretty well. And uh, you'll also notice that coronary height is the last thing on that list. Obviously, they have to be reasonably low. But if you just focus on coronary height without these other aspects, you will miss patients and get an unexpected coronary obstruction. Some CT pictures, uh, that is uh, with a 24.5 virtual valve, my valve. Uh, you can see uh, some of those features. So a long right coronary cusp, uh, which is clearly higher than the, the height of the coronary ostia. The right coronary height is 10. The frame of the valve will almost touch the STJ, uh, and this is with a relatively deep implant. On the left, uh, you see the, the left main is a little higher, and again, with a 60-40 or maybe 75-25 implant, we predicted that we'd be okay uh, and there wouldn't be high risk of left coronary obstruction. Uh, sort of uh, a transverse view uh, with a VTC of 2.6. Um, less than four uh, for a non-calcified leaflet, uh, but this leaflet was also, as you saw from the, from the uh, uh, sagittal pictures, was heavily calcified at the tip and looked like it would fit perfectly into the osteo of the right coronary. Planning of basilica, um, quite straightforward, really. A lot of it is CT planning prediction. Obviously, there are two, well, three key views, including the implantation view. Um, the first view is the, uh, the side-on view. Uh, so here we have the right coronary artery uh, uh, pointing towards the left, just under the green dot. This is useful for fluoroscopic confirmation uh, once you've got to a, a, a location uh, with TEE guidance and allows you to ensure that you're uh, below the coronary and at the base of the right coronary cusp. The other view that's uh, critical, but sometimes difficult to get because of the projections, is the uh, RCA on fast view. So this is looking at, uh, with the coronary pointing towards you, actually it's, it's ex exactly coming away from you. And here in the dark outline, you can see um, uh, the outline of the cusp, uh, the dot, the yellow dot is right where the right coronary ostium starts. And you can see how this will give you uh, another great piece of information about if you're in the middle of the cusp and also at the base of the cusp. The trajectory, uh, i.e. which way you're pointing, which you can't get from this uh, image, is obviously confirmed mostly with TEE, which is critical for both the left and the right uh, native or valve and valves. For the right, uh, often an issue, and actually it was an issue in this case, is um, hitting a sigmoid septum, those elderly patients with left ventricular hypertrophy uh, who have a, a very short uh, membrane of septum, so you have a very small amount of uh, a space. So if your transverse burn is a little uh, too long, you can catch some of that septum. For the left, uh, the danger is uh, burning into the left uh, atrium, which in itself uh, is okay. You can remove the wire and carry on with the case. Usually, um, it's a small hole that heals over. Um, of course, if you don't recognize you've gone into the left atrium and you are unlucky and then snare your wire through the mitral valve and then do a basilica, then we're talking about a different kind of complication. 
sizing um, to pick up on some of these issues. Uh, this is the MyVal uh, sizing app. Uh, this patient had an area of 445. So we are lying with a 6% oversize right in 24.5. Um, this is a common area of other balloon expandable valves where a 23 is grossly undersized and a 26 is grossly oversized. And I think this has something to say about lifetime management. Personally, at 23, I don't tend to put more than plus two milliliters, which would take you to about 0% oversize. Um, if you go more than two, uh, the smaller valves, uh, not just my valve, but uh, all balloon expandable valves tolerate that the least well. There's a lot of tension on the leaflets, which probably correlates to uh, a poorer long-term outcome. With a 26, we'd be talking about a 26 minus three to get to a 10% oversize. Uh, and this obviously has an issue with pinwheeling of leaflets under expanded valve and uh, also probably uh, an issue with long-term outcome. 24.5 with 6% oversize is just perfect for me. A lot of people aim up to 10%, but we found with Compare Tavi that if we aim actually towards the 5% side, uh, our pace maker rate comes down to an even lower percentage and also the PVL rate is absolutely minuscule. Uh, as uh, we've presented in TCT uh, with our MRI subgroup analysis from Compare Tavi, we're talking about PVL, mild, mostly mild PVL rates of around five to 6%. So basilica planning, uh, high risk RCA obstruction uh, with a deep implant. I felt that there's a lower risk of a left coronary obstruction, uh, right native basilica with a little bit of awareness of the sigmoid septum. And uh, lastly, to implant the Myovar Octocore with commissural alignment with the Alloctor Align System, Octor Align System, which we'll go over shortly, and then obviously an angiogram uh, immediately afterwards. If this patient needs to another valve in five or 10 years, and we have a commissure lying directly over the right coronary artery, it's basically gonna make this patient almost impossible to treat. So commissure alignment in this case, in particular with such small sinuses that are gonna be filled by leaflet is absolutely critical. Um, should this patient survive long enough uh, into 10 years for a second valve. So no audio, I'll just speak over the pictures. You can see in these procedures, the, um, uh, the uh, focus is on echo images. Um, we have a, a X plane of the aortic valve. We have some fluoro where I'm just injecting. I'm communicating with uh, Frederick uh, uh, as to where I am exactly, uh, repositioning. You can see the position here is not ideal. Um, just switch back to the echo images shortly. And repositioning, this is a right coronary catheter, uh, repositioning with a snare underneath. So we've got one catheter going through the valve, which is the dot just over here. And the dot of my catheter, where I'm doing the basilica from, is just here. So I'm getting towards the right spot here, and uh, shortly we'll continue to a, tra uh, to a traverse burn. The idea is, this is actually a left native with a, an AL3 catheter, um, that we have an arrangement where on the, uh, we have the snare underneath, just under the, uh, the cusp. We have a catheter here, uh, which we have uh, usually a piggyback, but you can use a caravel together with a starto wire. We burn through, preferably directly into the snare, uh, snare the wire and externalize it just into the tip of the catheter. Uh, this is me just preparing the back end of the Astato wire. So this, in, this is a, the DRY part of the procedure, scraping off the green uh, insulation, uh, making sure you do this thoroughly so you have a good contact point. So I'm just going to forward wind this a little bit. Uh, and then attaching it to your diathermy machine. We're going to do the transit burn at around uh, 30 watts. This is a two-handed procedure. If you fail to do your transverse burn and you're worried about you don't have electrification, this is the first connection to check uh, and, and redo. Then we have a setup. Um, we have a 5% dextrose syringe attached to a TUI, um, which is to flush blood out, which is ionic and will disperse the, uh, the charge. We have the uh, piggyback catheter with the astato wire, and here we have uh, a large uh, torker to ensure that the wire doesn't slip as we're pu pushing forward or pulling back. 
and we have three people, one injecting the, the 5% DEX, myself coming forward with the uh, wire, and one of our cath lab nurses on the yellow um, uh, button on the diathermia machine with 30 watts. So it's important everyone knows what they're doing. Very quick, quickly, you can see the transit burn happening over here uh, towards the snare. Uh, confirmation with echo. And the idea now is that we've snared the wire. We bring the snared wire just into what was the LV catheter, uh, back out the piggyback, and make the flying V, which is denuded area of uh, uh, wire, and then bent over with a scalpel, which you'll see next. So that's a, there's a very, this was actually a long case because I caught the septum, and we ended up doing a, a mini sesame as, as well. But it, it took time to snare the wire. <coughs> it's, of course, edited out, so it looks very swish. So we just caught the wire. You see there's a little bit more blood on the bed there. That's because actually we were at it for about an hour trying to capture that wire. I'm now going to back out the piggyback to a hand's width uh, so I have a little bit of space. And now forming the flying V. Very simple operation. One hand width back from the TUI. Little scrape on one side. flip the scalpel over, and bend the wire over. Simple. <laughs> and then we end up with this arrangement right here. So that's a perfect flying V. So the idea of the flying V and the denudation is to focus the charge, which is going to be 70 watts this time, to pull back on both the catheters, so it's important the wires and catheters are fixed at the, uh, the outside of the body, and to make the uh, uh, slice in the right coronary cusp. So you'll end up with a TAVI implanted uh, with a slice in what in our case will be native leaflets and easy access to the coronary. So here you see the actual basilica, so I'm pulling back electrifying the wire, and that's it done. At that point, it's important to make sure that you have a nice uh, straight cut from the base to the tip of the leaflet. You don't have many second chances, but you do have a chance if you have a very oblique uh, cut to switch over to a chimney stenting, which we try as hard as we can not to do in these younger patients. Now, commissure alignment, as I said, I'm going to go over this very briefly. We have three minutes left. Um, it's a very, it, it looks a little bit complicated, but it's very simple. Uh, the concept is that uh, we take some CT planning. In this case, we've got a, a right coronary coming off at 12 o'clock. We tend to align on the coronary rather than the commissure, um, but a lot of people also will align on the, on the commissure. And the concept is that we need to put one of the pledgets in the crimper at 12 o'clock. And why at 12 o'clock? That will be over the coronary, so that doesn't make much sense. But as the valve comes over the arch, the whole thing, thing flips around, and it means the commissure is on 180 degrees on the opposite side. This works quite well, and obviously in this case, it's critical. So this is a, an aligned system. Uh, you have a clock face on the crimping system, and you can see the pledge here at 12 o'clock. Just a little more detail of what I've just said, really. Uh, planning on the CT, getting what we call the clocking, 12 o'clock here, getting the pledget on the crimper before the valve is crimped. It sounds complicated. It's actually extremely easy. Uh, and then you see uh, on this particular case that we have the common shore aligned at 6 o'clock. So now we're going to implant our 24.5 MyVal. Uh, pretty straightforward part of the uh, procedure, but of course everybody wants to see the, uh, the patent right coronary artery. We have got 1 minute and 38 seconds left, so I think we're good. But I am going to forward wind just a little bit. So inserting the 24.5 pre-dilatation of the sheath uh, isn't mandatory with that size of uh, a valve. We are going to come over the arch. Actually, the system is so flexible that we rarely use flex. Um, it really tracks very easily, a lot like a self-expanding valve. What I would say also is on the horizontal aortas, in order to not get a skew uh, valve implantation on the left coronary side, you can make a very easy maneuver where you grab the uh, delivery device and the wire, so you're pushing wire 
and delivery device and flattening everything out so you get a very nice horizontal uh, implant with uh, the same depth all the way around the annulus. So here we're a little bit too deep. Uh, we're aiming for a deeper implantation because of that left coronary uh, okay. issue. Uh, you can see the uh, implantation marker just here. Backing everything out a little bit. It's important with the MyVal system to take the forward or the backward tension off. So if my last move is forward, I tend to retract a little bit so it doesn't dive on implantation. And we're going to go for an implantation here. Just keep an eye on, as we go into rapid pacing, on how this valve moves, or rather doesn't move, and also focus on the foreshortening. Um, it's quite incredible in terms of how still, it how still it is and how predictable it is. Eventually, I'll get there. Here we go. So we have a valve that just sits there perfectly, with no foreshortening, very predictable. And I'm going to fast forward uh, to the coronary angiogram, checking the valve, obviously, checking for flow on TEE. Oops, that wasn't very clever. Sorry. I'll just forward wind this. And we've got a right coronary catheter. I can see the left main, which was never going to be an issue. Slip the catheter around, slotted it into the right coronary. You can see how low it is. No problem. Um, so, commissure alignment, basilica, nice implantation, uh, both coronaries survived. So, just quickly, because I'm running over time slightly, right coronary is a little bit more difficult than left coronary. Be aware of septal hypertrophy in the right coronary basilica, sewing ring versus annulus versus leaflet with a valve in valve. Often you think you're burning through the base and you're actually burning through the sewing ring, so you have to come a little bit more towards the tip. Fluoro gives 2D images. You have to confirm with two views and TEE for projection, uh, trajectory uh, by uh, TEE. Uh, always confirm rooted the astato Y, ensure it's not in the LAA or the septum, and lifetime management of AS means common sure alignment is critical. Thank you very much. So we will have to uh, conclude this uh, symposium. I mean, uh, the room was full. I mean, it's quite amazing on the third day of uh, PCR London. I have one question for you. Yeah. In this case, yeah. Chimney is not an alternative. It is. We don't like to do it. Um, it also gives issues if we do the second Tavi. Um, she's a 76-year-old lady. Uh, we don't really want to have a stent hanging out of the coronary and going up the side of the stent. Um, so basilic is a relatively, once you get used to it, an easy procedure. There's one member of the panel who has not said anything so far. So in the ends of uh, Philippe is straightforward. That's the word he used. Uh, what is your takeover, takeaway of this? I mean, uh, is, is that something that you would do, that you do? Um, yes, again, this is something that we consider. Uh, what you, you know, what we know that this kind of procedure now is very well step by step described. So it's no longer, you know, a, a very complex procedure. What is often difficult to predict is what you need to, if whether or not you need to do it, uh, as compared to just not doing, do, not doing anything, because, you know, the more complex is the procedure, the more, you know, we know the longer is the procedure, the more risk you have. And, and if you come back to the final imaging of, of this procedure, you saw that actually the right was slightly above the top of the, uh, the right icon, it was slightly above the top of, of, of the device. So, Again, you say, okay, maybe we, did, we, we are not so sure where it was helpful. But also what is important was regarding the chimney, because we see a different strategy. We have seen three cases in a row with a chimney uh, for the valve in valve, and here a different approach. Of course, to, left us, to leave a stand there is against the idea of coronary access. You have flow, but you lose the coronary access. So indeed, either on doing nothing or, or, or this uh, basilica technique. Thank you very much. So we have to close. I think that, uh, sorry, we have to think, uh, thanks, uh, Mary Live. I mean, it was a superb uh, symposium, really pushing the envelope. I mean, uh, Bicuspid, Basilica, uh, large annulus, and so. 
I think uh, many, many message to do. It's really a front line in the field of uh, aortic uh, replacement. Uh, I think we have to thank Mary Life and the ingeniosity coming from India because to move from an hexagon to an octagon uh, is not a sinecure, it's not something easy. So thank you the speaker, thank you the panel, and thank you the sponsor and the audience. <laughs>